So, my gardener is in the cloud. Robert shows up on Tuesday mornings. He backs his van into the, into the driveway. He opens the gate. He pulls out his mower and his blower. Some weeks a trimmer always has a rake. He unlocks the gate and he goes about his work. And he spends about an hour. And after about an hour, he's done. All I need to do is have my bin available for him. And I need to have a, a, an espresso. Because I think I've got him hooked on a weekly extra fit. Even if you only glance at the technology news today, you can't help but read about cloud. It's become a very big word. And it's got a lot of people talking a lot of excitement about it. Robert is all you really need to know to start understanding the cloud. He's a on-demand service model. I pay for his services. When I need more, I ask for more. I schedule it. In the spring and in the summer, he may show up with his son to do a little bit of pre-summer growth preparation, to pick up the leaves, to take away the tr broken trees. I can hire him for transplants and removals. Everything that I do beyond the basic service that I pay, it includes even coming around and taking care of my cat for a weekend if we decide to go away. Now, cloud is very similar to this, except for the cat feeding. It's a commercial model where you store your programs and your data across the network on somebody else's computer. Cloud has also been referred to as a utility model because like gas and like electricity, you can turn it on and turn it off. You get it as you need it on demand and you pay as you go. You don't need to go out and buy uh, big computer rooms and servers and data storage. And I don't need to go out and buy a lawnmower and, and garden trimmers. I can have the work done by the cloud provider or by my gardener. The cloud provider, by the way, is not in the cloud. They're somewhere down the road in a traditional data center, maybe in Kent, maybe in Manitoba. It, it could be in Iceland. It doesn't really matter. But cloud computing, while it's simple and while it's similar to what we've been doing before, it's not rocket science and it's not exactly brand new. We're going to come back to Robert after a little bit, but I think that he's done a pretty good start of showing us that technology can be made a little bit more clear and a lot less complicated. Done well, technology adds value, it delivers revenue, it creates wealth. And it is the critical and fundamental bridge to where we're going in the future. I've been in the industry in technology across a bunch of different sectors for about 30 years now. And the one primary lesson that I think that I've learned, or one of the most important, is that you use technology for a reason. While it may be fun, it, people don't really spend money on fun except perhaps for the video games. And all the other entertainment that technology gives us. But you need to have technology to solve a problem or to prevent a problem from happening in the first place. You need to have technology either earn money or stop money, resources, and time from being wasted and spent. That didn't quite work. We skipped a side. Here we go. Thank you. The future. I picked up Future Shock from my brother's uh, bookshelf when I was about 15 years old. I don't know how many of you in the room have read it, but it's something that I would recommend that you all do. And it's even available in PDFs free on online. Just do a little bit of a Google search. It was a table of contents that to a 15-year-old was pretty exciting. It was talking about subterranean cities, cyborgs, uh, hippies, sensory overload. And actually, it wasn't all that much fun to read. It was a little bit heavy and a little bit tough. But when I picked it up 10 or 15 years later, I realized that there's a fair bit of what was going on, whether it was information as power or information as knowledge, whether it was the technology engine. These were the things that were already happening by the circumstance of the technologies that were evolving. But the problem is we didn't have the processes and the people behind the scenes to take care of the, uh, the detail that we needed to do, the human engineered planning and design to ensure that we're able to deal with the technology and, and actually take better advantage of it. He also spoke about the flow of situations. And I found that it was actually the cause and the explanation for everything that was going on us. Because what he talked about was a chain reaction of change that would cause or result in more change being required. So it's real, future shock. And so is, it's not exactly a new thing, but it has been around. And pass me that water, please. Cheers. And we use this flow of situations to actually work in our favor because it's the innovations that enable other innovations that allow us to do things better, stronger, faster, and cheaper. We architect our business solutions the way that architects are meant to uh, design high-rise buildings to deal with things like the winds and the earthquakes. We look at making things more extendable. We deal with the future. We allow it to flex and grow so that it meets our requirements as we go forward. We're meant to analyze the risks. We can plan and we can ensure and we can figure out where we're going and what we want to do. It's not 
It's not an ideal world where we're all going to spend our time exactly expecting the worst, but if we are aware that it could happen and we are prepared for it, then there is the chance that we might be able to roll with the punch and we, on occasion, can take the momentum of the change and of the shock and to use it to our advantage. This is where I compare the person who dips their toe into the pool before they jump in as the person who just dives straight in. You'll get the similar physical shock when the water is ice cold, but the person who's dipped his toe first has advanced knowledge. He has the potential to reduce the psychological impact and the shock, and he also has the decision to change his mind. The toe dippers have this advanced knowledge simply because they look for it and they work for it, and if you don't and you don't plan for it and you don't seek it, then you won't have it. I'm, am I pouncing slides around, folks? Apparently. So, <laughs> this is uh, going to be a little bit of a, my apologies. So Robert does a fair bit of good garden work for us. He does the mowing, he does the trimming, he takes care of the details, and he has a fair bit of knowledge. I know he knows where to plant the trees in the shade and where he plant, knows what to plant in the sun, and I've seen him read the labels, so that's part of the reason. But when I asked him to transplant a palm tree for me, this is the result that I got. And it wasn't exactly the way that the palm tree was expected to, to look. And after a few months, we were talking about it and trying to figure out exactly what we could do about it. And his response to me was, we are where we are. And I can't believe how many times I've heard that in business meetings. We are where we are. And it always comes across as, as an excuse. It comes across as a, as a barrier to, rather than figure out what we've done and move forward and plan and deal around it, what we have are people that are using it as an excuse and they just want to plow forward. And it's the planning that actually makes a really, really big difference. We are where we are, which is just a, a mark on the floor. It's very simple. The first time that I heard it, I was thinking, there's got to be a better answer. And if we don't think of where we are as all itself, then we need to think a little bit further back. We take a look at where we were. And the distance and the difference between the two of them is where that we have the lessons that we were learned. Sorry, the, where we have the lessons that we've learned. Where we are is always going to be our starting point. But unless we know where we were, it's kind of difficult to figure out which way is forward. So, I'm having a great time with our multimedia today. Uh, once we have a way forward, we know where we're going, we can actually draw a path, we can figure out a road map, we can work our way and, and, and figure out where it is that we're going. We can start to discuss the factual differences between people's perspectives of where we are and where we were and where we're going, but the most critical impact is that we position it and we know what we're doing. Otherwise, if you don't enable yourself to succeed, why would you bother starting in the first place? And if you don't know where you're going, if you don't understand what success looks like when you get there, you won't know that you've achieved it. You won't know that somewhere along the way you won't be able to recognize the potential failure that you need to, uh, to help you to determine that it's time to make an adjustment, time to make a change. So with this clear way forward, we, we start going off. And then, of course, more change happens, more changes occur. But the differences between these two points are not necessarily as bad as it looks, as long as they're heading in the same direction. And just because something new has come along, a business change, an opportunity, legislation, it doesn't necessarily mean that you want to start over and you don't need to waste and repeat what you've done before. If you've got a budget and you put in a 200,000 pounds worth of computer equipment in an office two years ago on a five or six year plan, it's probably not the best idea to just throw it away today and go out and put it all on cloud. And that sounds like a standard and easy and obvious thing to say, but funny enough, it does happen a, a quite a fair bit. You need to adjust to meet with the current position, and as change happens and as new opportunities along, you don't keep going down the, what is now known as the wrong path, but you do take a look at how you can adjust and how you can move yourselves forward. And as you move forward, you start to take advantage of the other technology and you ensure that one hand knows what the other hand is doing. You update the roadmap along the way and you communicate. And if you do this, then you have an, actually have the opportunity to be able to succeed together. A little bit more on why where we are and where we were matters. If we take a look at world population, which we talked a little, about, a little bit about earlier, there's a nice rise that's coming with this and it's projected to continue along the same way. If we add on to the top of this a graph of, this is, if we add on top of this the graph of cars and trucks and we start to see the lines and the, the increase here, and again, both of these lines 
they're converged at where today is. This is, does not necessarily mean that today is where we're going. The next slide combines information. Okay, thank you. The next slide combines data and devices. And this is the amount of information that we have in the world. And if you take a look at the, the sharpness of this line, if we move this bar forward to 2020 or 2030, it's going to continue like that. These are going to continue like that. The amount of data that we have, it's, it's stunning, it's phenomenal. Eric Schmidt from Google calculated that in a 48-hour period today, we are creating as much data in the world as between the time the first caveman drew a painting on the wall and 1983. This is happening every 48 hours. So yesterday and today, and we're contributing it here with our tweets and everything else, we are doubling the amount of data that happened yesterday. And if you compare it and if you take a look at the lines and where we're going, if we didn't have the advances in computing and storage and capacity, we would be very, very struggled. The trouble is we also have a lot of information that we don't necessarily need. But we also don't know that. So we're going to try to change slides and see how that well works for us. Lovely. My wife tells me I use too many analogies, and I've already used a few up here today, but uh, a lot of what I end up doing in my work is really it's translating technology to business people and translating business requirements to technology people, and analogies seem to be the way that works the best. I just try not to sound too condescending because, well, people don't like that. <laughs> but a couple more. We're going to talk about the network devices first. And on, on the blue line was the network and the data. In 1985, you could have counted the number of network devices connected to what we called the internet back then, the same way that you would have counted the number of lawns in a typical block in Bristol. Six, eight, 10, 15 patches of grass. Today, you need to start counting the blades of grass. It's that phenomenal a difference. We've gone from 1985 with two or three to 2012 with 8.5 billion. Now, from zero to 8.5 billion, it sounds like an awful lot. But when Cisco tells us just a couple of weeks ago that we're expecting by 2020 to have reached 50 billion, the numbers are just phenomenal. They aren't worth discussing. And th the truth is, it's not really important. This is it's the infrastructure. It's everything that's actually getting to the point where the things that need to be connected are being connected. The things that should be connected will be. And there's lots of stuff that is connected that probably doesn't need to be, and that that will continue to go on. But the amount of data that's traveling over that is, is again, the ph phenomenal part. Because if we start talking about data and forgetting about the plumbing and the infrastructure, data is what I get excited about. If you think about the rivers and the streams with data f as flowing by in them, that's an awful lot. But if you start to think about big data, it's a little bit more like an ocean, or, in fact, all of the oceans. Uh, the amount that we have, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking for a boat on a river system, you know where the river starts and finishes. We've got maps. We've got ordnance surveys. We know where the bank of the river is. We know there's a boat there. We can find it. On the oceans, we don't even know that the boat exists, let alone where to find it. So it, it's getting very tricky. It's getting very difficult for us to be able to see what's out there. The thing about technology, a lot of the technology that we have today, it's advancements, it's improvements, it's enhancements on the things that we've had. Mobile phones, the, I mean, nobody will argue the vast difference that we have in mobile phones and the amount of power and processing that I carry in my pocket beats the first mainframe computers that I was studying on in the late 70s. But it's just the same as what we had before, except now it's in my pocket. Maybe it's got a camera converged with it and a little bit of other stuff. But the difference is with big data, we don't know what we can do with it. We don't know what's there. We don't know what's available to us. And we're just starting to try to develop the tools to be able to extract it and to find it and to sort it. It's a, it's a phenomenal amount of information that, if you think about it, it's not actually a technology itself. It's really just a byproduct of the technology. So we have created this, and now we actually have something out of all this stuff we've created over the years that they're, they're trying to figure out ways to extract more value from it. And it is encouraging and designing of new technologies to be able to let us do this, both software and hardware, the storage, the speed, everything that we need. But the thing about the data is that it, um, it allows us the same way a DNA allows a criminal forensic investigators to be able to go back in time and determine more information, we have more information and more context. And we can, from this, start to learn a little bit more about what it was that we did right so that we can repeat it, what it was that we did wrong so that we can learn from it. And while cloud and all of these other computing advances are pretty exciting, they are really just the delivery vehicles that will take us to the treasures of things like big data as we start to uncover them. 
like I say, it's not a technology itself. It's a byproduct. We have massive amounts of data that companies are trying to figure out how to extract value from that's just sitting there. So anything that can allow businesses to start creating more value without having to build something new is kind of interesting. So the gates are being opened. We're being op they're being opened by the computing power, which, funny enough, the power of a computer allows us to create more powerful computers, which then allows us to create more powerful computers. There's a gentleman called Moore who coined this law. And it's probably the first and only example that I've ever heard of what we call a, a good vicious circle. When we combine that to high-speed, massive communications and storage that's available, and, and again, the amount of data that I'm talking about, it's, it's a good thing that we have the storage. When people come to me and ask, can we solve this, can we do this, my first answer is almost invariably yes, with the resources, with the time, with the money and the flexibility. As long as you're not asking me to beam me up, Scotty, then there's pretty much not anything that we can't do. But I don't think that's going to continue. We need to work with the people. We need the resources. And the human resources are probably, like the ocean's important, but without people, we probably wouldn't be as interested in it. And without the generations to come, uh, we're, we're, going, we're going to struggle. We need to get these generations to understand that we, what we can do. We need technical people to design and build clever technical things and to solve problems. We need data analysts to figure out across all sectors, what can we do with this information? How can we extract our value from it? And we need innovators. And you can't create innovation. You can't do anything but encourage it. And to, to paraphrase Sir Ken Robinson talking about education, there's an awful lot that government le legislation and management can do to stifle innovation, which is the exact opposite of what we need to do. I think the, uh, ah, here we go. Our troubles seem to have gone away. I think the. As far as the future goes, the most significant part of it is probably the last two letters. And I'm going to start off with the Renaissance and Reformation. And if we think about the amount of massive changes that were shuffled through in these, driving the future based on what had come before them. Incidentally, both creating great massive waves of future shock along the way. So once again, this is not something that's new to us. And it's something that if you can be ready and avoid it, it tends to make shock a little bit simpler. The same value should be coming from us rethinking, reconsidering, rewiring, and redesigning the way that you're seeing things that are being done. And I especially ask this to the business people, the young ones coming in as well. Make them think differently. Make people stop working the way that they're doing. Let's work collaboratively. Let's forget agendas that are not the direction that we need to pull. It's, it's kind of, it seems to me like it makes an awful lot of sense. And when I work in an organization with people trying to do their thing instead of our thing, it's not only frustrating, it's backwards, and, and the amount of money and time that we waste is phenomenal. So like dipping our toe in a pool, it's good if we prepare. We want to have a little bit more advanced knowledge of where we're going. And if we do this, then we can start to reduce the, the amount of shock that we have. I'm in my 50s, my early 50s. So you're not the only old bloke around. Um, and I can see clearly that the first half of my life I lived in the past. And the last half of my life I've been living in a very challenging and interesting future. And actually, hopefully, it's not the last half of my life. I'm hoping that the life technologies advance as much as the death technologies do and that we can stick around a little bit longer. But I do want to say that I think Alvin Toffler had the right idea, he had the right vision, but the forecast was wrong. We, we talk, he talked about splintering society and all of these different subcultures pulling away from each other. But what? That's really a natural thing. That's what we do, and that's how that we work. And what the technology has done is it enables us to connect where we want to and disconnect when we choose. It delivers the value that we're looking for. The communications were just... We need to think, again, about what we're building, and we need to work a little bit differently. If I was asked how I would solve the problem of the future, I would start pretty simply by saying, let's look at how we communicate, how we collaborate, and how we educate. These are the three areas that we need to focus on. Beyond that, I'd say that we'd have to work on this together. And finally, my cleaners are also in the cloud. Thank you.